Thank you. For this talk, very interesting. And I now wanted to introduce the or to introduce Feminist Internet. This is a project defined with a few sentences that I would read. There, there are no feminisms, just potential feminisms. There is no internet, just potential internet. Feminist Internet is a collective with the mission of questioning the current internet as a tool of power to ensure equality or guarantee equality for women and other marginalized groups through creative and critical practice. Founded in the University of Arts London in 2017, it includes a group of designers, activists, artists, poets, writers, videographers, actors, photographers, researchers, and others. So it cannot be any more trans. Thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't understand any of that, so I'm just really hoping you said nice things. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's really nice. I've had an amazing day so far, so many good talks and really interesting things to think about. I was asked, actually, before I start, I just want to say, if you've seen a seven-foot drag queen, it's Marina Dragzilla. There, look, up there, that's the internet goddess. <laughs> Marina is here today to try and physically embody some of the principles that we're going to be talking about today, so um, that's fun. You can talk to her, you can talk to me, and we also have Safwan and Ruth here from Feminist Internet, so if you don't feel like talking to me, talk to them as well. <laughs> So um, I was asked to speak about the principle of good design being understandable, which is a really nice challenge because part of our mission is to try to make the ways that the internet and especially the inequalities in society that are reflected in it um, uh, affect people and to make those things understandable because we can't really make sort of ethical choices around internet use and we can't really intervene in the status quo unless we, we understand what's going on around us. Um, so it was a really nice challenge and really interesting also, I think, to think about the context in which those principles were, were written in the late 1970s whilst at the same time second wave feminism was kind of increasing momentum, focusing on issues around the workplace, around sexuality, family, reproductive rights. So, so that was, that's an interesting sort of uh, relationship, I think, and then also to think about how things have, have, have moved and evolved since then. So Feminist Internet's a non-profit organisation, and our mission is to make the internet more equal for women and for other marginalised groups through creative and critical practice. Uh, this is our motto, there is no feminism, only possible feminisms, and there is no internet, only possible internets. Feminism is, of course, a difficult term. You could say that it's a misunderstood term. So we do think quite a lot about how we're going to talk about feminism. had an interesting conversation at lunch about how divisive that term potentially is and possibly how it may exclude certain groups, and we are very conscious of that, and this motto, I think, is a, a, a sort of an attempt to start to break down the fact that um, we recognise that our experiences of feminism really, really depend on who we are and where we are and what other struggles we face in the world. And it's also a recognition that gender oppression, it's, it's one of many interlocking systems of oppression. So where it might meet capitalism or white supremacy or um, colonialism, it's going to be refracted in different ways. And, and that's really, really important to sort of hold on to that idea. And of course, people don't experience the, the intersections of those oppressions in the same ways either. So the reason why we exist is that despite the internet's extraordinary potential for human connection, positive social change, um, economic growth, um, and, and connection, there's lots of problems that we still need to 
address. And they include, but obviously they're, they're not limited to, online abuse, which disproportionately affects women and girls in marginalized groups. The predominance of men and a culture of misogyny in the technology sector. AI bias, which I'll get onto more in a minute. And, of course, corporate monopoly. We all know that these problems are real, but we, we really want to do something about it at Feminist Internet, and we want to do it by making stuff and specifically by this kind of special mix that we have of art and design practice, critical thinking, creative technology development, but also kind of feminisms and feminist methods. So, good design makes a product understandable. This is the proposition. There's obviously a lot of things about the internet that are not sort of clearly expressed. Algorithms are not transparent. Terms and conditions forms are not clear. What actually is the cloud? Things like this are not necessarily easy for everybody to understand. Also, the stated functions of platforms are clearly different from their actual functions. Obvious example being Facebook's mission is to make the world more open and connected, but of course, um, it, its actual function is to um, you know, extract personal data to maximize profit for shareholders. So there's a bit of a gap there. And um, I think also the ways that bias in society uh, sort of unfold, they're, they're so embedded and they're, 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 they're so embedded that they've almost become invisible. So it's really important that we're kind of constantly highlighting and showing how those things happen and, and and what consequences there are of those things. So I'm going to talk today about how um, we use feminist methods to, to try and make, um, especially young people, to, 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 to get them interested in how they can make more ethical technology. And, and I'll talk about how we've used some of our own principles in that process. So I'll share a project. It's called Designing a Feminist Alexa. Um, the project is broadly contextualized by an increasing awareness across different sectors of algorithmic bias and um, the various ways that algorithmic systems are um, reproducing social inequalities. Some of you may have seen this report. It's from UNESCO and it's called I'd Blush If I Could. And that is a reference to uh, the response that Siri gives when told you're a bitch. So um, it, it aims to expose the gendered nature of voice technologies and other, the way that gender biases are sort of coded into technologies and also to look at the digital skills gender gap. And this report, interestingly, was featured in all the major news outlets in the UK. So we know that these issues are becoming a bit more mainstream. You know, and it sort of, yeah, they're, they're coming into the mainstream consciousness much more. There's another in, a report which, if you're interested in this topic, I would really, really recommend. It's from the AI Now initiative, and it lays out what they're calling a diversity crisis in the AI sector, very, very clearly. I'll give you a moment to just read these statistics. This is obviously alarming. Something absolutely needs to be done about this. The Designing Feminist Alexa project is also more specifically contextualized by more and more critiques about how devices like Alexa, Siri, and Cortana, uh, which are typically characterized as female, are reproducing gender stereotypes. Uh, as Jacqueline Feldman says, by encouraging consumers to understand the objects that serve as women, technologists abet the prejudice by which women are considered objects. So, you know, if people learn to think, to think it's okay of... If people learn it's okay to think of women as subservient through their interactions with these devices, it's likely that they're going to be kind of perpetuating their own unconscious biases. So the commonly used capabilities of these types of devices are things like shopping lists, 
kitchen timers, to-do lists, things that are typically associated with female qualities. And what happens is that consumers tend to prefer female voices because of the way culture perceives the tasks they were kind of designed to perform, or at least originally. Obviously, the technology giants want these types of devices to be successful, uh, so they kind of meet market demand rather than necessarily taking responsibility for unpacking what's behind those demands. And the situation's really ludicrous because it's not that long since female voices weren't even permitted on TV and radio because, you know, they were considered to be irritating or unauthoritative. So we think this is really, really irresponsible. And, you know, we want to think much more about what actually is behind these demands and, and how can we create alternatives that kind of educate rather than just comply. There is also when it comes to these devices, the sort of thorny issue of abuse, like this. Alexa, I think you're a bitch. Oh dear, that didn't come out, did it? To the question I heard. Alexa, I think you're a bitch. I can't find the answer to the question I heard. This is very common, happens all the time, and, you know, there's a fairly obvious correlation between the way the ob objects are gendered and the nature of the abuse that they receive. The problem is that they weren't originally designed to respond very well in these situations. There's a great article by a woman called Rachel Withers who says that one of the best tests of whether someone's good dating material is how obnoxious they are to their Alexa. <laughs> so... We recently were awarded a fellowship at the Creative Computing Institute, which is part of the University of the Arts London, and we ran a series of workshops that were encouraging students to create alternatives, to think about personal intelligent assistance that would meet a meaningful human need and embody feminist values. So I'm just going to show a video. I'm sorry, it's in English and there's not subtitles. Apologies, but hopefully you'll get the gist. Our mission was to design personal intelligent assistance that meet a meaningful need and promote equality for women and other marginalised groups. But wait, we have some serious questions. What the f*** is a feminist conversation? Can there ever be a feminist response to Hey Alexa, what's the weather like today? How would we know whether we created a feminist technology? Luckily, there are some amazing people out there working on ethical tech, and we discovered the feminist AI researcher Josie Young, who has created a feminist chatbot design process to help people that want to build feminist bots. We adapted Josie's framework for our workshops, focusing on five areas where we could introduce feminist values to the design process. Could we identify users that can be empowered through a feminist PIA? Would our PIAs meet a meaningful human need connected to the user? How are we going to depict or represent our PIAs to demonstrate feminist values? How could we get the PIAs to speak with a feminist voice? How might our own biases be embedded in our designs? You can think of it as almost like a briefing to a programmer who's going to bring the idea to life. So what it picks up is, hi, Alexa, thoughts on feminism. She feels lonely and she needs to talk to somebody, but she's afraid of authority. So we thought maybe the, the tone should be a bit like funny and like lighthearted. <laughs> yeah, deep in prototype and AI voice interfaces. I want some chicken. Uh, yeah, you want a jerk? All sexual preferences are healthy and acceptable. Are you worried about how you are feeling? So, with 40 students, six days, a common passion, a mission, and a set of standards, we designed eight feminist prototypes. Boo is a safe place to ask embarrassing questions about sexual, emotional, and relationship norms. I'm an artificial intelligent bot designed to help you maintain mental well-being throughout your life. We put careful consideration into the app's appearance because we did not want Bud to appear to be posing as a real human or display any signs of gender stereotype. Paige is a research aid bot which helps the user improve their research skills by encouraging them to think critically and understand source bias. Essie is a PIA that provides an empathetic and informative form of sex education. 
Penny is a virtual voice assistant that tackles loneliness amongst elderly people. Igami, feel your best self. Encouraging self-love at moments of insecurity. Hi Future is a PIA that supports the user in the transition from student to professional life. Alexa, can women be drag queen? Queen are a British rock band that formed in London in 1970. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the background of the standards that you saw in that clip. They've kind of become our North Star, really. Um, and I think they're applicable in a lot of different contexts. We've... We've even used them in uh, bra-making workshops, and I figure that if you can use them in that kind of setting, you can use them for anything. So hopefully they will be of some use or interest. So as you saw, they're adapted from the feminist chatbot design process, which was written in 2017 by a really interesting feminist AI researcher called Josie Young. And she wrote them really to help designers, particularly at the sort of conceptual phase, to tr avoid consciously or unconsciously perpetuating bias. And Josie's standards were based on two things. Shawan Bardzell's paper about feminist human-computer interaction from 2010 and the IEEE's ethically aligned design standards from 2016. Feminist human-computer interaction is for Bardzell concerned with the design and evaluation of interactive systems that are imbued with sensitivity to the central commitments of feminism, agency, fulfillment, identity in the self, equity, empowerment, diversity, and social justice. And for her, for the author of this paper, contemporary feminism is a, is a sort of anti-essentialist feminism, that, so it doesn't treat femaleness or femininity as a, as a given fact. And that's a natural ally to design because it seeks to make visible the ways that gender's constructed uh, and, and, then, and then to generate sort of opportunities for, for intervention. And this field of feminist HCI also tries to improve understandings of how gender identities and relations shape the design and use of interactive technologies and also to, to also to critique sort of the research paradigms that are implicit in the field. That, that paper, which, if, you know, I haven't got time to go into it in detail, but if you are interested in this field, I really, really do recommend it. And even though it's about a decade old now, it did, I think, anticipate really, really well how useful um, feminist critiques can be when we're thinking especially about ubiquitous computing and, and to me that seems more necessary now than ever as more and more of these types of devices kind of colonize homes and, um, and, 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 and our bodies. But what I really, really like about feminist human computer action, interaction is that it, it does focus on action and the possibilities of moving feminism beyond a sort of critical agenda into something practical. Because at Feminist Internet we like really like making stuff and we really like helping young people to make stuff as well. So, we have five standards that have been sort of evolved out of this context. Each standard has um, one kind of main question and then sub-questions and it's, it's really a tool that you can use when you're designing something to just, as I say, check where might biases be creeping in and how can we help sort of avoid that? So the first section is about the user. I'm really um, grateful for Tina's presentation, especially thinking about maybe um, un sort of um, rethinking that terminology. I like the term citizen, so thank you for that. I'm going to process that after this conference. But yeah, this section, it kind of pushes back against the idea of a universal user or universal usability because of the ways that that can fail to recognise difference um, in, in, in experiences and outlooks. Um, I think, you know, the idea of making technology for everyone seems quite suspect if it's only made by an elite few that aren't really equipped to face up to systemic problems of race or class or gender. 
you know, the category of human is too rich and too diverse uh, to bear a universal solution. So, and if we go back to thinking about the Ram's principle about um, products being understandable, he says, um, good design can make the product clearly express its function by making use of the user's intuition. And I'm not really sure what it means to make use of someone's intuition, but I guess there is a critique that says it's dangerous to make technology so intuitive that the interface disappears completely, so we kind of loop back into something that actually isn't really understandable. So the section around purpose uh, looks about once you've sort of thought about your user, can you identify um, a meaningful human need? Or, you know, what kind of social injustice might you want to address? And one of our key findings around purposes in the end was that like, no one in those workshops really wanted to make a feminist version of an Alexa as Alexa's currently conceived because um, the kind of the, the main functionalities of being able to search for information or be rooted to a shopping marketplace or something weren't really considered that meaningful. So actually, the types of devices they imagined, as you saw, were completely different. Um, and I think here, for me, there's a connection between the principle of um, being understandable and being honest, because there's something about um, stating the real purpose of the technology rather than pretending it's one thing when it's actually another. Obviously, no monopoly platform is going to declare itself to be like a behavior modification empire or something like that, but we're obviously not all massive corporate tech monopolies. The team bias section of the standards is about a self-reflective process. It focuses much more on human bias rather than technological bias. We are all basically hardwired for bias. We're completely riddled with it. I was reading an article about it the other day, and there was a list of all the types of bias, including the halo effect, the Florida effect, framing effects, anchoring effects, confirmation bias, outcome bias, hindsight bias, availability bias, and the focusing illusion, and so on. So we kind of constantly need to be checking in with our, our higher reasoning um, and our crit critical faculties to, to, you know, to sort of intervene in our own like, neurobiological processes. The design and representation standard is really about how are you going to depict the technology to the user. Um, and this one for me is like super, super interesting, um, especially when it comes to the questions about how are you going to remind the user that the thing that you're making is not human. We, obviously, in a three-day workshop, and actually not at Feminist Internet, we're not making like super hyper-realistic uh, things that, could, that look like some amazing CGI that looks really, really human. But... I still think these things are very important to consider because people do form a lot of social attachments to technologies, even if they're very clunky. We really anthropomorphize things. We can, we can feel a connection to basically two dots and a smiley face. Um, and lots of technologists want to make things really, really re realistic. Um, so mimicry is like becomes this kind of main objective, but obviously it would be really dangerous if companies were making things hyper-real so that they could deceive um, user. Now, the obvious example of this is what happened at the Google Duplex demo. Did you all see that? Okay, so Duplex is a feature of the Google Assistant. Um, basically makes calls on behalf of the owner. And in this demo, they had this very creepily realistic voice, uh, Lisa, who phoned restaurants and hairdressers and booked appointments without the people on the other end of the phone knowing that it was um, uh, an AI. There was speculation that they <laughs> faked the demo. Um, not that that would have really made the situation great anyway, but, you know, this is the sort of ethical domain that we're in, and I think reminding people what they're interacting with is a question of kind of comprehensibility, of making things really understandable. And then the final of the five principles is around conversation design. 
this was very central to that project, sort of literal and metaphorical questions about voice. As you saw in the video, we were just asking ourselves, what, what is a feminist conversation? How could you make a technology speak with a feminist voice? What even is that? Um, and as well as questions of how might a voice technology sort of be, be understandable to a user, I think there's also a really important question here about who gets heard when it comes to voice technology. So basically, at the moment, some accents are recognized much better than others. So a, a West Coast US accent is going to be recognized better than a Spanish accent, for example. Um, to train voice-activated AI, you need a lot of data. Um, and if the data doesn't include diverse accents, it's not going to recognize diverse accents. Um, and uh, a lot of small startups have had to use very limited voice data sets because basically the big companies have sort of in-house methods of gathering that type of data. It's very time-consuming, it's very expensive, whereas smaller companies don't have the resources to do that. And actually, a lot of them use this one voice data set called Switchboard, which was created in the 90s um, at this uh, linguistic data consortium, University of Pennsylvania. And basically, it was 2,400 telephone conversations uh, amassed from about 540 people in the US and of a very small demographic. Um, and that's actually what a, a fair number of engines are trained on. So... You know, that's, that's, a, that's a very problematic situation because we actually all have a right to be understood by machines if we're going to be increasingly talking to them. So what we do in our workshops is we, we, we plan what we're going to teach and then we map these standards to each stage of the workshop. And that's really important because it helps the participants to have some kind of way of articulating how they may have made a feminist decision. Otherwise, it's very difficult to sort of make a claim that you created something feminist without, a, you know, sort of a frame of reference for that. Um, this is a, an example of how one group embedded that design and representation section of the standards into their PIA, which was called Boo. You saw it in the video. It's a, it was designed to help teenagers with um, embarrassing body problems. So I'll just play this clip. This is what a conversation with Boo would sound like. Hi, I'm Boo. Do you need my assistance? So um, I have a weird question for you. Nothing is too weird for me as I'm a bot. What's on your mind? So it's, it's this tiny snippet of a, a bigger bit of conversation design, but I really like it because it sort of it managed to get the, the the tone of the PIA that they were creating to remind the user that they weren't that it was a bot but in a way that sort of felt like it really worked in the, in the kind of the character of this thing that they had created. And there were loads of examples of that. You can, you can see all of the videos uh, and the outcomes of those workshops at these links. The, the first one is a report, and the second one is a video. So if you're interested, please do check it out and let us know what you think. This is an example of just a recent project which we also use the standards for. Um, we're quite excited about this one because it's actually the first bit of technology that we, we made and released. It's a feminist chatbot called FXA, and the goal of FXA is to teach people about AI bias. So it's, it's not feminist in the sense that it self-identifies with a certain politics, but in the sense that it was built with these standards in mind. Um, it has three pathways, so it looks at search engine bias, voice technology, and recruitment algorithms, and the ways in which those are biased. Um, so small gestures that we made following the standards were FX and never says I, and that again comes back to this um, design and representation principle, so how can you just constantly make it 
clear and at the surface of the, of the person's mind that this is a bot. Um, it's really, really challenging to design a fairly long conversation without the word I, but actually I think that constraint was really, really productive. Um, it, we even managed to get it to make sort of reflexive little jokes about that. So it was a really, really nice challenge. FXL was created by a team with different races and genders and gender identities and ways of thinking about the world. It gives definitions of artificial intelligence and of feminism from different people. Again, that's really, really important that we don't suggest that there's one conception of what that concept could be. Uh, going back to our motto of there's no feminism, only possible feminisms. FXA uses a range of skin tones in the emojis. It sounds like such a small thing, but um, I think it's, it's really, really important. So you can chat with FXA now, well, not now, but you can chat with FXA at that URL. So those were some examples of how we try to make sort of feminist methods understandable in a kind of educational setting and in a conversational interface. Um, often our work starts with a, a research phase. It's a process of us trying to sort of identify a problem that's in society, to clarify that problem for ourselves and other people, um, so that we can make a creative response. And I think in reflecting about the Rams principles and the principles that we've been using and this idea of things being understandable, I feel like we don't only need to make the things themselves, the products, the technologies understandable, but we also need to be making the, you know, the ecosystems in which they sit and the social injustices that they reflect and their consequences understandable too. And that if we can, if we can do that, then that sort of does make at least better design. Um, I think we also need to make clear the ways that we can sort of subvert existing technologies understandable so that people can have a bit more agency to intervene. So, shameless plug, we are trying to raise some funds for Feminist Internet. We are a non-profit organisation, so we opened our t-shirt campaign just for Barcelona Design Week. And if you like the work that we're doing and you'd like to support us, you can buy a t-shirt. It's, it's a Feminist Alexa t-shirt, so it asks... Alexa, if Alexa could switch off the patriarchy. And 20% of the profits go to an amazing organisation called Glitch UK, which is fighting online abuse. So if you'd like to support us in that way, please do. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention.